Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at www.audibletrial.com slash historyfangirl. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Kindle, Android, or MP3 player. Hi, I'm Stephanie Craig. Welcome to the History Fangirl Podcast. This is Episode 10, the UNESCO World Heritage Site List. This week, I'm at a travel blogging conference called TBEX in Ireland, and I wanted to take the opportunity to do a special live episode where I interviewed Gary Arndt. He is the travel blogger and photographer behind the website Everything Everywhere. He has won many National Photographer Awards, and aside from being a internationally famous travel blogger, he happens to be my friend, mentor, and the person that inspired me to travel to UNESCO World Heritage Sites. And while we are both here in Killarney, Ireland, I wanted to have a conversation with him and share with you a little bit more about the UNESCO World Heritage Site list, what it is, how a site get added, and why it's important for history travel lovers to know about this list. At the end of the episode, find out how to enter this week's contest. So my guest today is Gary Arndt of Everything Everywhere. He is a quite renowned travel blogger. He's won the SATW Travel Photographer of the Year Award. And we are live from TBEX Ireland, which is a travel conference. And he just gave a really amazing keynote. So hi, Gary. Hi, Steph. (laughs) Thanks for coming on. (laughs) So the reason I wanted to interview you is um, I've talked a few times in the show about traveling specifically to UNESCO World Heritage Sites. And you are actually the person that inspired me to take a look at that list and get started. And so first, I want to say thank you. You're welcome. And on behalf of everyone at UNESCO. uh... (laughs) (laughs) And then also, I wanted to take a step back because if you love history and you're listening to a history podcast, you probably love World Heritage Sites, but you may not know anything about the list. So this episode is all about the list and some of Gary's amazing travel experiences at some of the different UNESCO sites that you may not even have heard of. So... First of all, how did you get started traveling the UNESCO World Heritage List? By accident. <laughs> so I sold my home in 2007 with the intent of traveling around the world. And one of my first stops is in Hawaii. And I visited Volcanoes National Park. And while I was there, I saw this sign saying uh, UNESCO World Heritage Site. And I was like, what's that? So I went <laughs> online and I, I searched and I found out that there was like 800 of them, I think, at the time maybe high 700s. This is 2007. So I started looking at the list and most of the things I'd never heard of. And I realized, well, okay, I was planning to go to Easter Island. So that would be one. And then I was going to go to New Zealand and they had two. And uh, I was going to probably go to all those anyhow. And then I noticed, well, there was one in the Solomon Islands, (laughs) which was on a remote, like not the main Solomon Islands. So I'm like, I'm going to go to that one just because and to see what it was about. And so I did. And I remember it was kind of a pain to get there. Uh, You had to take a flight to this island and then you land on a grass strip on one end of the island. And then they drive you to the other end of the island. We had eight flat tires from from where the plane landed to get to the lake. And they had to fix the tire every time. They had no spare, uh, which was rather remarkable how they did it. And uh, it it was a really neat experience. And so I kind of began going out of my way to visit places on this list. I visited more in the Philippines, some in Japan, uh, like Yakushima. And when I was there, I realized I'm I'm the only non-Japanese person here, that the Japanese knew about it, but very few foreigners did. And there were some really great spots that I would otherwise not have visited if it wasn't for the fact that it was just on the list. And so it kind of became a thing, uh, something that I did. And it's something I'm kind of known for now. I've been to 337 as of the time of this writing. And by the, so we're recording this in October, 2017. And uh, by the end of the month, I'll have been to five more. Oh, nice. Yeah. Where, where are the next five you're going to? Argentina. So I'm going to Iguazu Falls, which oddly enough is two World Heritage Sites. Yeah, because it's on the Brazilian side and the Argentina side. They're both their own. Right. And I don't know why that is. It's kind of dumb. But, you know, there's transnational World Heritage Sites. This isn't. Uh, then I'm going to Los Glaciares National Park in Patagonia. Then I'm going up to Salta, where I'll be going to uh, the city of Humanca. And then the Inca Road thing that I can't really pronounce Quina Parak or, or something. There's a lot of World Heritage Sites <clears throat> I can't pronounce. <laughs> so, yeah, that'll, that'll be at 342 by then. And 
Uh, I was supposed to bend to more, but yeah, I was hoping to get to 350 by the end of the year. So just to put it into perspective, I've been to 83 of them and I started doing this a year and a half ago. So if you wanted, like once you get the bug, you just kind of keep well, going. If you travel in Europe, uh, I think like 40, 45% of all of the world heritage sites are in Europe. I think they're mostly in, like Spain, Italy, and France have like an have insane percentage. Yeah. And, G- and Germany has a ton. Yeah. And quite frankly, if you look at it on like a per capita or per area basis, Belgium and the Netherlands have a ton. So, and so it's very easy. You're almost never, if you're in one of those countries, you're like never more than an hour away from a World Heritage Site. Whereas in the U.S. and Canada, they're very spread apart. Yeah. And the ones in the U.S. and Canada are a lot of uh, landscape and... and natural. Bi- yeah, natural. Yeah. Was, so it should be noted that the World Heritage Sites are cultural and natural. And then there's also a category for mixed. And I would say two-thirds of them are cultural. So let's take a step back and... What is the UNESCO World Heritage Site list for people that aren't familiar with it? So the the program actually dates back to the late, the the genesis of it came back to the late 1960s. And it was an idea from the Johnson administration of creating a list of places that are special to uh, the heritage of the world. And the idea was kicked around and then they passed the World Heritage Convention in the 1970s, which I should note is separate from UNESCO. So there are countries which are signatory to the convention that are not members of UNESCO. Oh, really? There are members of UNESCO that are not signatory to the convention. That's becoming less and less over time. Like I think Tuvalu just signed the convention, but they were members of UNESCO or vice versa. (laughs) So there's a couple odds and ends like that, but they are different things. And even though they're called UNESCO World Heritage Sites, the convention is really in that. So the annual meeting is of the convention. And UNESCO kind of maintains the program, if that makes sense. Yeah, and the convention is every summer. Like in June. And the, it's where they announce what the new ones are going to be, and they add between 10 and 20 every year. Oh, so it's more one. like 20 to 25 now. But I think they're trying – the problem is there are so many, it's kind of diluted the, the meaning of it. And, you know, the Great Pyramid, the Great Wall of China, those things, they were all put on the list rather early. And so now the things that are being added are kind of ever more obscure. Yeah. There are some really obvious things that you kind of like the Okavango Delta in Botswana got added and you're like, that wasn't a World Heritage Site. That should have been done like, you know, (laughs) but for whatever reason, the countries, um, you know, there's the reason why Italy and China and Spain have so many is because their governments invest a lot into pursuing it. And some governments, especially in Africa, are quite poor. And so they don't put a lot of effort into trying to get world heritage status for things which probably should or could. So why don't you tell us a little bit about how something becomes a UNESCO World Heritage Site? So the actual government process. So each country submits a tentative list. So it's up to them. And they say, these are things we think have the potential to have outstanding universal value. And there's pretty much no limit to what they can do. Some have very long tentative lists. Some have very short. So, for example, if if a lot of people in your audience are familiar with the United States, I think they've just upgraded the tentative list, which now includes the Brooklyn Bridge, which is really the first major suspension bridge in the world. Oh, really? Um, Central Park, which is a great example of, you know, urban engineering and and the creation of that. Several of the civil rights sites. I just I just went around this and they're trying to resubmit them to be an official one uh, in the next year. Right. And they're expanding it. Right now they're looking at over 100 sites that could be and they're going to whittle it down to an appropriate number. White Sands National Monument is on the the list. Several of the buildings of Frank Lloyd Wright are on the on the list. So that's kind of what it is. And in the US, Canada, and Australia tend to have more natural sites. Because we're kind of a newer country, we just don't have a lot of old stuff. Whereas Mexico, which has more sites than, than quite a bit more sites in the U.S., has a lot of cultural stuff because the native peoples that lived there, the Aztecs and the Mayans, had built things out of stone, uh, whereas native peoples in the U.S. and Canada usually didn't. Also, a lot of Spanish colonial heritage, which is still around, and most of the U.S. never really had colonial cities or things. You know, Boston and New York did, but even then, most of it's gone. But you get to like Chicago or something or LA. I, you know, in California, you'll find some Spanish. Um, so in the US, the San Antonio Missions, which includes the Alamo, is one. And I just was there in August. And 
part of why I like traveling the UNESCO World Heritage List and really appreciate that you turned me on to this is that I had been to the Alamo before, but I had never invested going to the other missions. They they're became, cooler than the Alamo. They're way more beautiful yeah. than the Alamo. Like I put together a video and it was a pain to even put the Alamo in the video because the other ones are so pretty. I had so much better. Well, everyone knows the Alamo because of the battle and everything, but it's smack in the center of town. And there's all these like, you know, the Ripley's Believe It or Not Museum and all the the, the cliche the tour theater. stuff is all around the Alamo. And the Alamo is not that big either. It's tiny compared to the other right. ones. Right. So and, and the other ones are not far out of town. You can get there in a car quite easily, five minute, 10 minute drive. And uh, yeah, they're they're certainly much larger, but they weren't the scene of the big battle. Yeah, so so the first time I went, I was probably nine. It's actually the first World Heritage Site I ever went to, but it wasn't a World Heritage Site at the time. Did the Alamo, didn't do anything else. Went back this summer, rented a car. Each one is like three kilometers apart, so there's technically a walk that you can do mm-hmm. to go from place to place, but I, in August, it was not, I was not doing that. And then the, I want to say it's San Jose and San Juan are, are two of the coolest buildings in the world I've ever seen. And if it wasn't for this list... I don't know if I would have taken the time to find them, but I felt compelled to find them because I didn't want to just go to the Alamo. Well, there, you know, there are certain things that are in the public consciousness. There are things that we know about from movies, books, history. And so the Alamo, if you're American, is one. The Taj Mahal, the Eiffel Tower, the Great Wall of China, the pyramids. We know those things. But that's just a small number of things which are World Heritage Sites. And I'd say 90% of the time when I visit one that I haven't been to, I'm pleasantly surprised. I'm like, oh, this is, this is cool. I didn't know about this. 10% of the time you kind of scratch in your head. You're like, why was this put on there? (laughs) But, but most of the time it's, it's pretty neat. Oh, and and to get back to how it becomes something. So every country has a tentative list. And then from there, there's a nomination process. So that's when the real work begins and it can take years, sometimes more than a decade. They have to do a lot of research And I've met with the World Heritage Administrators for several sites who were instrumental in getting it to become a World Heritage Site. So I went to Grand Pre in uh, Nova Scotia, and I got to meet the guy who headed it up. And he showed me they had volumes of data. And this includes, like, surveys of all the land around it because they need buffer zones and, you know, a plan for what they're going to do in the future in terms of upkeep and maintenance. And so there's a lot that have to, has to be done. I went to in Jordan to the, the Bethany baptism site. I went there. Yeah. I met the guy who was responsible for that. He showed me the book and they had this enormous bound volume of, and they had to show, you know, back in time, how far could they go where people were referencing this location as being an important spot pertaining to the life of Jesus. And they had to really do a lot of research. So there's a lot that goes into it. There's only a couple cases, and that happened like in the 80s, of certain sites sort of just being done by a claim. Yeah. Where they would say, oh, pyramids? Yep. Okay. That, those were <laughs> obvious. And today it's a very involved process and it's a very expensive process. You're looking at a minimum of hundreds of thousands of dollars for a site to be put on the list. So it's a, it's a substantial investment which is why there tends to be more in developed countries than in lesser developed countries. So for the U.S. right now, the process they're doing for the civil rights site, so the civil rights sites are already, already tentative, but it's, I think it's just three or five. They've expanded it to 100. They will whittle it down, but they have to put the same amount of research into all 100 of those sites, and then they'll whittle it down. I don't know what their target number is. So I met with some of the people that are working on it, and the process that they're working on is so intense, and it's such a, like, a work of passion and love for some of these people. It's the culmination of their academic work is to get it to be recognized so that more people come and see it. And and so that'll be what's known as a serial site. Mm -hmm. So for example, some are just like a place like Yellowstone national park or uh, the Cologne cathedral. It's that thing. But then there's what's called serial sites, which are so like, it might be in Topeka where Brown versus board of education sites in Alabama sites in Georgia. So all of them collectively will be part of this world heritage site. And sometimes there are serial sites which have, like, hundreds of places. <laughs> uh, the Belfries in Belgium and France has, I think, over 50 oh, different wow. ones, like villages and towns you can go to. And the rock art of the Mediterranean in Spain, I think there's, like, over 500 locations, many of which are not open to the public. Yeah. Uh, so there's only a couple that you can actually visit. But it, it can get very confusing sometimes as to, like, wait, is this part of the site or not? <laughs> 
And I've literally had to do some research, like, have I visited it really, or I've haven't I? I've had to I? do that before. And also there are some, like the Stessy, which I'm pronouncing wrong, I think it might be Stetchy, and uh, there's so there are these grave markers that are Bosnia grave markers, but they're they're all spread out over Bosnia, Herzegovina, Serbia, Montenegro, and Croatia. And I just went to one of them. But even to find that one was very difficult. And when we got there, there were some Serbians having a party and basically sitting on top of these rocks because they didn't even recognize it as an important place because it's it's a serial site. It's spread out over so many places. And this is just their backyard park where they throw their parties. And they're like, why is this American girl taking pictures of us on these rocks? It was, it was awkward, but it was fun. Um, what would be the top three that you've been to? Like, what were your favorite three? Oh, man. That's so hard. Because it's very difficult to compare natural sites to cultural sites. So let's stick to cultural just because right. we're mostly a history show. I'm a big fan of the industrial heritage sites. And this is something that most people would never think to do when they're on vacation. Like, I'm going to go visit a factory. <laughs> but, you know, if you think about it, in the modern age, industrial development was a really important part of how we got to be who we are today. The early industrial revolution in the 18th and 19th century, even in the early 20th century, it was really important. So I just got back from Norway where I visited the uh, industrial site in uh, Rukon and Notraden. And basically what it was is it was one of the first places where the, it was the largest hydroelectric facility from like 1905 to 1911 were found in this area. And the reason why they were built there, you're up in the mountains of Norway, you got running water, was because the process of taking nitrogen out of the air to make fertilizer required electrical arcs. And they didn't know how to transmit electric, electricity across wide, long areas. So they had to build the plant next to the electrical generating facility, which was in the mountains of Norway. And this was right after when they discovered, because there was a lot of concern in the late 19th century about starvation because we were running out of guano and fertilizer. So the development of artificial nitrogen fertilizers was a huge deal. We don't think about it now. Yeah. But, uh, you know, they were talking about, you know, they've solved starvation. We've, we've you know, world hunger ended because of, because of this. And so this was one of the first plants that developed this before the Haber process was developed in Germany, which was for the creation of ammonia, which could then be converted into nitrogen fertilizer. So, you know, when you put it in those terms, you know, it, it, it's involved with the early creation of electricity, nitrogen production, which was important for farming and everything else. It's kind of important, <laughs> yeah. you know, but some of the neatest ones, uh, the Volkingen ironworks in Saarland in Germany. Okay. Because that's like going to the set of Robocop in the final scene where you have this ironworks that's like all these pipes and beams and everything. And it's this, you know, steampunk type environment. Um, and basically it became a World Heritage Site because it was cheaper than dismantling the facility. It stopped oh. operation. Oh. It was built in the late 19th century, stopped operation in the 80s. And it was simply easier to turn it into a heritage site than it was to dismantle it. And probably a lot better for the environment because in the process of tearing things down, you, you can create a mess. Other sites, Angor in Cambodia, I think is, is one of the best. And I should say it's Angor, the whole complex, not Angor Wat, which is simply one mm -hmm. of temple. There's tons of temples. And if you go to like Google Earth and zoom in on that part of Cambodia, you will notice a giant rectangle. That's Angor. You can see it from space, and it's just temples and temples and temples. That's, I think, uh, you know, really one of the great ones. Non-modal in Micronesia, very few people know about it, but I would put it on a par with, like, Easter Island in terms of cool stuff in the Pacific. Oh, wow. But, yeah, it gets no visitors. Yeah. Hardly anyone knows about it, but it's called the Venice of the Pacific. It's a series of these small islands with basalt. It's like a log cabin made out of basalt, like rock, and... They know from, from geologic testing that the rock did not come from that island. It came from another island. They're not entirely certain how they built the boats to, to transport it because they're big and heavy. But again, it's, it's, it's really cool, and, and so few people have been there. Then there are some mixed sites. There, there's not many mixed sites, but they have both a cultural and natural one. And one of my favorites would probably be Kakadu National Park in, in northern Australia, where you can see cave paintings that go back over 10,000 years. Oh, wow. Uh, on the walls. Do of, they, so, rock. like, how Les, you know how Lascaux doesn't let you see the real one, that you see a copy, 
And uh, I just went to one in Bulgaria that's the Thracian tomb of Kazanlak, and that's also a copy. You can't go into the real one. Do they let you go to the real one there? No, these are real because those caves, uh, like the caves in Spain and, and France, the real famous ones, they were covered up for centuries, right? And the problem was when it became open to the atmosphere, mold and algae mm-hmm. started to come in. These have been open, you know, they're not in a, a sealed cave. They okay. were just under like a, a rock overhang open to the elements and it's been that way forever so people aren't changing the environment no and and it's in a dry area it's in kind of a real arid region so the problems with mold and algae that you get in those caves is not an issue there okay that sounds amazing i haven't gone to australia yet actually i shamefully haven't really gone to southeast asia yet either and i'm trying to rectify that hopefully in the beginnings of next year we'll find out (laughs) we'll see what i don't really know where i'm going to be but i'm trying to get out there uh, what would be the strangest one you've ever visited? Not disappointing, but just strange. Head smashed in Buffalo Jump. That has the strangest name. I yeah, think, of it certainly any of them. does. <laughs> it's not strange. I mean, a lot of these things, when you learn about the history, you, you understand why they were put on the list. Head smashed in Buffalo Jump is in Alberta. It's in the plains. And basically, it's kind of a, a cliff that kind of juts out of the plains. And what the native people did, you know, people forget... The, the native people in North America did not have horses. Yeah. Horses were brought by the Europeans. Actually, there's one place where all the horses came from. It was a ranch in New Mexico that was under Spanish control. They were stolen. And within a generation, they had gone from never having seen a horse to being some of the best light cavalry in the world. But I digress. <laughs> um, so this place in Alberta, the way they used to hunt bison is they would herd them by hand and push them off a cliff. Oh, okay. And then at the bottom, women would be there butchering the bison. And then over time, the bones and other remains piled up over time. So they have a massive excavation there, and they have a great visitor center to show you where, like, you know, 6,000 years ago, there was a lot of activity. And then for whatever reason, there was no activity for a period of time. And then activity started again. And I wouldn't have thought that head smashed in buffalo jump uh, would be <laughs> so neat. But it really was interesting. And gives you an insight into, because there's not a lot of sites that deal with native populations in North America, like I said, because there's not stuff that they left. Yeah. Uh, Skungwai in British Columbia is another one. Okay. And it's, it's spelled really weird. It's like Skangway, or, but it's, it's, called, <laughs> it's pronounced Skungwai, and it's the location of the last remaining original totem poles that were put by peoples in the Pacific Northwest. And they're not going to be there much longer either. So oh, the, really? the Haida people, it's in a Haida village, have made the decision to let the poles decay. So they're cleaning brush and stuff, but that's all they're doing. And they're Is probably, it in danger of getting delisted? No, uh, because it's in the middle of a national park. It's in the middle of uh, Wyhannis National Park. So they will. there's talk of extending the site to include the park. And it will become a mixed property. So okay. there's still some other Haida things in the park. But the park itself is actually really neat, too. And it certainly is worthy of inclusion on the list, I think, on its own merits. So what is the one where you went to and you were like, eh, I wish I hadn't have taken this trip? <laughs> uh, Holosovich in the Czech Republic. It's this bohemian village. And I'm like... Why, why is a bohemian village of universal interest? And I was there and I'm like, yeah, I, to this day, I don't really get it still. What was special about it? Maybe I missed something. Maybe I got to go back and get a tour guide. Yeah. But even if I, fe- I felt like if they gave me a, a great tour, I'd still be like, okay, but why is it a World Heritage Site? I feel that way about, I went to uh, the modern apartment complexes, which isn't the name, but in Berlin, yeah, there's there like too. modern apartment complexes. And it was just like me standing at, in a building that people just live in now. And I felt like just going to your friend's apartment building. There's a very similar site in, in uh, Tel Aviv, the white city of Tel Aviv. And I've always felt that was one of the most disappointing ones because it's just, okay, that building's part of the site and that isn't <laughs> why, you know, they're not, the buildings are not particularly good shape. Uh, there's very little to set them apart from the other buildings. There's nothing indicating this is part of the World Heritage Site. If they have a walking map, I never saw it. There's no signage. And I even went back this year to Tel Aviv to re-see it with a guide. With yeah, because a- I met you in, uh, in Jerusalem. Yeah, so I came back with a guide. So I'm like, I'm going to give this another shot. And I still was like, nope. 
<laughs> and, and, and it's not like, you know, uh, a lot of the buildings were like Bauhaus type buildings. And there's a great World Heritage Site in Germany dedicated to Bauhaus, Bauhaus University and, and some other things. That I think is interesting. But that, you know, particular implementation of it in Tel Aviv, I just, they, they, they need to do more either to showcase certain things. But as it is right now, it's just, okay, there's an apartment. And in the same in, in Germany. They're, the housing styles are very similar. Yeah. And you're just walking. I walked around the neighborhood and I saw, you know, which buildings were in it. And it's like, okay. It's know. like my pictures. I haven't even posted pictures from it yet because it just looks like I went to a friend's house and stood outside their building and took pictures. There's a couple other that are really disappointing. The Stokelet House in uh, Brussels, completely closed to the public. And I mean <laughs> completely closed to the public. So I've pulled as many strings as I could with tourism boards and everything, and they can't get anybody in. Oh, no. It's a privately owned home. As far as I know, there has been one group of people in the last decade that has ever set foot in the house, and it was made a World Heritage Site as pro- when it was privately owned, so nobody can visit, and if you go stand outside the house, the facade does not face the street. Oh. faces the backyard so you can't even see that and <laughs> i've seen so i went and did some research i saw photos and there are like beautiful edvard monk no um what's the name is a german painter but like fantastic art inside it's actually an architectural masterpiece but nobody can visit can you make friends with the family like <laughs> no i guess the remaining um grandchildren or children of the the guy who built it in the early 20th century are like in their 80s or 90s and there's talk of the national government buying the building or something, but they can't agree on a price because, you know, there's, there's yeah. upkeep involved. The other sites generally, which are rather disappointing, are paleontology sites. Sangaran, early man site in Indonesia, I went to, and that's where Java man was found. Okay. So the skulls of early hominid. That's interesting. But it's like this is the place where this <laughs> thing happened. Well, well, so, but it's and, not there anymore. But the skeletons, yeah, they're in a museum. <laughs> so it's just, this is where we found a thing once. And there's nothing to see. If there is other interesting stuff there, it's buried in the ground. <laughs> you just can't see it. <laughs> and so there's been several paleontology sites like that where you go and it's like, well, what, what do you see? So what's the most remote place? You might have already mentioned it, but just what is the most remote place that you've been that's a UNESCO World Heritage Site? Probably would be East Ronell in the Solomon Islands. Okay. Uh, but there are some extremely remote ones. Heard in McDonald Island in the southern Indian Ocean. Gough Island, which is off uh, Tristan da Cunha in the South Atlantic. Henderson Island, which is near Pitcairn Island in the South Pacific. Again, okay. there's, there's, you know, other than Pitcairn, there's nothing inhabited within a thousand miles of it. Papahana, Hono, Mecca. I forget the pronunciation, but it's the outer Hawaiian islands, basically. So a lot of people don't realize that the state of Hawaii is actually really big. It's just that most of it, no one lives. Okay. Do you have like the the populated islands? And then it just keeps going all the way to Midway Island. That's like a thousand miles or something. And no one has ever lived on these islands. So that's all a World Heritage Site. And there's only one place you can actually visit, which is Midway. And they haven't allowed any tourists to go there for five years. So... I keep waiting for someone to do a trip. Uh, is this the Bikini Atoll one? No, no, no that's okay. different. Uh, Bikini is also, uh, it, it's relatively hard to reach because you have to get to the Marshall Islands. And then from there, you got to get a flight to Bikini. And I don't think anyone it has any permanent residence right now, but okay. there's sometimes uh, dive companies that take trips there. And I, I, I'm on a Facebook group with a guy who went there within the last year. So it is possible. Okay. What was the one that was the biggest surprise that you were looking forward to the least? And when you got there, you were the most happy you'd been? I don't think there's one I was looking forward to the least. I'm always kind of open-minded when it comes to, to visiting some of these. But uh, Plitvice National Park, I think I'm, I might be pronouncing it wrong, in Croatia was really neat. Uh, part of it was great. Uh, it's just a series of waterfalls are very colorful. The day I was there, there was a snowstorm in early April, which almost never happens, and all the snow clung to the trees. Oh. So my photos of the park are like green water with just everything white. Oh, wow. And that turned out really neat. Jerusalem, I was very impressed with. I you know, there's so much to, to see there, uh, so much history, and, and even in the smallest things. You know, and then there's some of the, like, the, the mega sites, which are like Rome. Yeah. Where they just lump everything together because... Is- yeah. <laughs> like the, the European city centers where, you know, I don't know how many World Heritage Sites could exist in Rome if you did everything on its own merits, but it 
probably be a lot. So yeah. they just kind of lump it all together. And there's so much exploring, you know, you can do. So what is a place that should be on the list but isn't? Oh, I have to think of it. I was just in Ethiopia last year, and uh, there's this one of the oldest structures in Africa. It was on the tentative list at one point, and Ethiopia took it off the list. Uh, I visited a site in Sweden earlier this summer, which is the oldest petroleum refinery in the world. Mm. And it's like right next to a World Heritage site that's an old ironworks. And I'm like, well, why don't they extend it to include this? I, you know, There's a couple ironworks on the list, but nothing about the history of fossil fuels or oil. Yeah. And it, It's a 19th century building. And you go in and you can smell the oil oh, really? everywhere still. Yeah. It just permeates the air. And it's, do you know if there's have any plans to put it on the list? I don't know. And I, I think I think there's a lot of places in the United States as well. Uh, the U.S. has had a very on-again, off-again relationship with UNESCO and based on different political things throughout the years. I would like to see the history of early space flight. Oh, that would be cool. added to the list. So, like, certain launch pads uh, at Cape Canaveral, where people first went to the moon. Uh, and it could be a serial site, I think, with parts of Huntsville, where rockets were developed, and also part of Kazakhstan, where Star City was, okay. where, uh, like, you're in Gagarin. Yeah. And so I think these things could be a great serial site, talking about early space flight. There's a tendency to think, like, well, something has to be really old. But, you know, there are certain things which we know are important, like space flight. They're still there. We should preserve them now rather than wait. Yeah. <laughs> Last question about on this topic. The one that you're looking forward to visiting the most that you haven't visited yet. I've never been to mainland China. I've been to 120 countries. I haven't been to mainland <laughs> China. So the Great Wall of China, the Forbidden City, uh, those are all places I would love to see. The Okavango Delta, uh, Ngoro Ngoro Crater, those are places I would really love to go visit. The aforementioned Papahana Hono <laughs> Mekale, it, it, the one that's the only World Heritage Site in the United States I haven't been to. Okay. It's just because just it's so hard to get to. Um, that would be a great one to visit. I've been to 337, which I guess is a lot. That's a but lot. That's a third, yeah. <laughs> not even. So there's still two thirds that are kind of remaining. And, uh, you know, what I want to do someday in the future is do a big road trip through Europe. Okay. Where like three or four months, start in Portugal go through there, go through Spain, go through France, go through a bunch of Italy, and I could probably visit over 100, I think. You know, you can average one a day quite yeah. easily because they're not far apart from each other, maybe even two a day sometimes. Because some of these, like, you know, you go to Rome, that you can't see Rome in a day. You need a, a bit of time. But there are some of these where it's just like one small building, yeah. and you can do that in an hour. So so where can people find you if they want to see your awesome pictures and learn more about your travels? Go to everything-everywhere.com, and uh, you can easily see links to uh, my list of all the World Heritage Sites, and uh, I'm also working on visiting all the national parks in the United States, the National Park Service sites. Okay. Uh, that involves a lot of historical things as well, pertaining to the United States, obviously, uh, and uh, all my social media accounts as well. And you should follow his Instagram, because his Instagram is amazing. And I don't know if you actually know this, but I was looking at your followers on Instagram, and there are some, like television actors that maybe I'm a little obsessed with because they're maybe on Riverdale who follow you. Like you've got some celebrity followers. Yeah, you do. <laughs> I, I didn't did. tell you because I was like, I don't think he would care. Like, I don't think he would I know who this person is, but yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah, you got, he's blown up. There's a, a guy in the Canadian football league who follows me. That's the only one I know because he comments sometimes. <laughs> no, I follow this guy on Twitter and I love Riverdale and all my friends that were texting about Riverdale. And I was like, he follows Gary. I'm that looks one, like a crappy show. I don't. I'm, oh, it's 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 my kind of show. You can't take Archie comics and turn it into a drama. I just, <laughs> it's it's wrong. I will I will not tolerate Riverdale hate on my show. <laughs> well, thank you so much for coming on. It's been such an honor, and everyone should check out your stuff and follow you because there's some amazing places that you go that that some of us will then be inspired to turn around and take trips to. Thanks a lot, and uh, I've been enjoying your podcast. I've listened to all the episodes. So, oh, thank uh, you. Keep doing good work. Thanks. I want to say thank you again to Gary Arndt for coming on the show uh, to share his knowledge and some of his travel stories when he has been seeking out UNESCO World Heritage Sites. For those who've subscribed to the show already, thank you. If you want more episodes, please subscribe in iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. And take a moment to rate and review the show. It helps tremendously with helping others to find the podcast. 
And the price for this week is a $20 Amazon gift card. If you'd like to enter, follow the link in the show notes to the blog post on historyfangirl.com. All you have to do to enter is be a newsletter subscriber and leave a comment on the post. Good luck.